Everybody has a story to tell. Some people have been writing it down since they were kids. Others come to it later in life. But for a few, a point is reached where they become serious. Are these the ones we call real writers? I um, started writing when I was about sort of eight to ten. You know, me and my older sister used to sit um, in a corner of the playroom and write little stories in books that my dad got for us. Uh, I've got some of them here. Uh, we've got the best weightlifter in all the world. Um, got other ones. Um, what my mummy and daddy did for me. Um, the Jennings family. Um, stories. This is probably one of the big ones. Star, horse named Star. And all these adventures and he met a friend and they lived happily ever after. And this is another big one was um, Jerry in the Age of the Dinosaurs. Um, yeah, and then I stopped writing for a while when I got to high school. Probably didn't start up seriously again until I got to about year 12 and started to write uh, little poems, often little love poems that rhymed and I thought were really great and showed them to people and they said they were great too but didn't really mean it, I don't think. Yes, well I usually write in bed. If I can't sleep, I think, oh, now that's funny, I'll sit up and I'll write about that and I'll sit up in bed with all my pillows. I usually have a six pillows and sit up and write and any time I can't sleep I think it's a good time to write and I sit and write for hours sometimes and next morning I don't think some of it's so good. But... Um, well, for me, when I, I went from writing little love poems that rhymed and I thought were brilliant. Um, and then when I first went to a, a writing group, um, they asked horrible questions like, why does it have to rhyme and what does it mean? And, and so I guess I sort of went home sort of with these little poems that I'd loved in my hands going, oh my God, I'm going to stop writing. And I kept coming back and kept trying to um, you know, improve what I was doing. And I think I, without the writing group, I wouldn't have ever um, sort of um, picked up any sort of objective viewpoint of what I was doing. I would have stayed sitting at home writing love poems that rhymed. Oh, I really write because I like writing. I've always liked writing. I used to only write letters, but then I've got writing stories and I like to write all what happened years ago. And I thought if I didn't write in some of the things that happened, none of my grandchildren would know anything about the olden days or what happened. They used to all say, tell us something about the olden days and then, so that's how I really got started on writing. Fun City. I was privileged to grow up in Footscray. We lived in a cosy house surrounded by 13 peppercorn trees. It was in a blind street terminating at the railway line only three houses. There was a little shop on the corner owned by two sisters, Winnie and Agnes. When my sister Rita didn't want to do the dishes, which was most of the time, she would climb a peppercorn tree and sit there and no one could get her down. Although she was very good at running messages, often running to the bakery to get hot bread for breakfast. My father was very happy-go-lucky. He was a hand glass blower and worked at the bottle works for years, now called ACI. Dad sharpened the knives every week, sitting on a log out in the garden with his wetting stone. I well remember Dad sitting there one day when a persistent hawker came in. Dad suffered him for a while, then he said, did anyone see you come in? No, said the hawker. Dad got up with one of his sharp knives and said, well, no one will see you bloody go out. The hawker took to his heels and we never saw him again. Oh, I'd like to write... I always imagine I'd like to write a bestseller or something like that when you read of how many people are just sitting there. I only read last week where a lady was 70 before she started writing and she's just churning out one bestseller after the other. I think writing groups are really important for our new writers 
and that's writers of all ages, not just young writers. I think a lot of our new writers are coming from writing groups and that that group system or that group support is really important to a writer's development, or it can be. And I've read of an American writer who's famous, been writing for 40 years, who said that he, if he could have joined a writing group when he first started, he would have saved 10 years of slog on his own. Um, to me, a real writer is someone who enjoys writing. They should really try to set a certain time each day aside to have a special place, if possible, where they can write um, and to take, try and take a professional attitude towards it. Um, I don't really care about whether it's published. I mean, it's a great thrill, naturally, if you write something and it's in print. But um, I think the main thing is just to be able to write something, share your experiences, um, paint pictures with words. I feel I've grown over the last five years um, because of this special group of women that have helped me. Um, and I know by attending various different workshops and residential camps and things that um, my writing has improved. And uh, yes, I think I am a real writer. It's very important to me to belong to a writing group because you have an affinity with people with your own interests, people who can guide you and um, you form a very close connection with these people because you get support. And it's really good to be part of a group because it gives you an identity. The Strand, Williams Tower. Cranes line the far shore, offering steel to the altars of industry. Ships, green and brown, bright red and silver, slip beneath the girders of the concrete crescent. Close by, a proud pelican preens on a chosen rock. Swans glide regally and a pool flaps and flutters as a flock of gulls settles, white confetti on a blue veil. I consider that I'm a real writer. I'm sincere and I'm happy to go and listen to other people's works and I will write as and when I can. I don't follow any uh, strict discipline. I find that that's impossible, although sometimes people say, if you want to write, you can. I will take issue with that point. I think there are times when you just can't, but the desire still remains. Uh, people write to be creative. Uh, some write for therapeutic reasons. And many people have a story to tell or a particularly unique perspective to communicate. And one of the things that happens when you write is that you find your voice. But there are some people who never develop the skills to do that and it is then possible for other people to tell their stories, which is what happened with the um, play about the Westgate Bridge disaster that Foot and Mouth Theatre Company did. Um, they told the stories of many people who were involved in the Westgate Bridge disaster and performed them in a play, which allowed those stories to be told in a different way. We've been doing a project called The Bridge, which is about the collapse and rebuilding of the Westgate Bridge and in it we've done a lot of research in the community. So it's been um, getting people to learn how to do oral history in a sensitive way to the issues and also um, people's rights as individuals to pass on information. It's also about convincing those people that their stories are important. Often when you approach somebody they'll say, oh you don't want to talk to me, you know, I'm only a worker or I'm only you know, a local resident. And so often you have to talk them into the fact that yes, we do want to hear their story and that their story is important because their stories aren't what you usually see on stage. Some Sundays he'd put me and Michelle in the car. All of us together, off to see the bridge. Isn't it beautiful, he'd say. Nothing like this has ever been built before, Pat. 
We didn't care about his bridge. We were just happy to be with him. It took me a long time to get the courage up to drive over the bridge. I was shaken as I got in that car. And as I drove, I knew that I had more right than anybody to drive across it. I saw the toll booth in the distance, felt the anger rising inside me. Tears streamed down my face. I thought of the senseless waste of all those lives. As I got closer to it, I knew I wasn't going to pay. I'd already paid. We've all paid. I think the writing community in the West is unique because of their high level of mutual support and encouragement and I think the writing officer acts as a focus for that. Um, the, the writing officer is a person who is a support and a resource base and also a skills tutor and that focuses the writing activities and also allows the writers to develop new ideas. They are they are all very open to trying new things and also open to helpful criticism and they can't fail to get better when they're receptive like that. I think a good example is Vince Jones and the way that he's advanced and done the R RMIT course but also people like Vaughan Morby who has been a journalist for 30 years and he came and joined our writing for radio group and he's developed a real talent for writing for radio. patient in the Orbiter Space Hospital. Where? You are in orbit. Our hospital circles planet Earth every 40 minutes. But it's pitch black. Dark. Couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Cryonics patients begin their recovery in darkness. Now I will begin to increase illumination by a factor of five lux per minute. But why am I tied to the bed? I'm trussed up like a chook for the oven. Zero gravity. We must not have you bouncing off walls. No gravity. Doctors require that your movements be restricted until they examine you. A man can't even scratch himself. Stay calm. You are recovering from cryonic suspension. Cryonic what? Ten years ago, you went into the clinical state known as death. Your corpse was preserved suspended in liquid nitrogen and chilled at minus 196 degrees. You mean Marge had me frozen like a side of beef? Waste of money. And you have been stored at the Foundation for Infinite Survival in Berkeley, California. I remember. She discussed it with me. And I told her it had never worked. Now that new cures are available, many of our patients are being revived. Where are you hiding? I can't see you. I am in your pillow. You may call me Heck, short for Hospital Electronic Counselor. I've explained um, to someone that I found my words didn't have much meaning to me. I didn't see any value in words. They just seemed like a lot of hot air and I was even reluctant to sort of talk much because I felt it was so, um, I was so powerless that there was no power in my words. And it's only since I've gotten in touch with my thoughts and feelings that words have started to have a use to me because there's the conviction behind my words now and that's growing stronger all the time. Uh, in the two years that I've been writing, and I have written a lot of stuff um, just that I've put away in a drawer or some exercise book and not shown to anyone. And it's all really um, things that have happened in my life. So far, that's the case. Anything I write has got some basis, you know, to do with my life. And I only want to write from the point of view of truth. The Swimming Pool. Days of sun and kids swimming in our pool, the one that you built. 
It was a fantastic pool. The neighbors resented it at first, said their kids might drown. You built a fence high enough to keep anything out. Our son and the neighbor's kids learned to swim like fish. There were barbecues with the folk either side, not too many. They thought me strange. I tried to be one of the women they thought me different. Once when I'd been out all day, on the way in from the car, I began impulsively plucking at weeds in the garden, squatting down in my grey high heels and charcoal suit. You always said I was too impulsive. The lady next door and her sister-in-law passed. They nodded, then put their heads together and giggled. I had my own opinions about women like them who put a pow on their heads and chased their men down the street at 12 o'clock to kiss the new year in. I tried to win the neighbors, gave a party. My friend Kostos, a chef, helped me prepare wonderful food. I pinned sprigs of fresh Daphne all over my white crossover curtains. Another friend came to play his violin. Visitors who arrived late said you could hear his beautiful music from far away. The locals sat stiff, trying to look brave. I just wanted them to accept me. It was awful. When the party finished, I was drunk and began to flirt with my chef friend to save my sanity. You were probably in some corner worrying what to do with your crazy wife. It's years since we parted, but sometimes in my dreams, I recall the roar of the sea as we made love in the cozy caravan rented at Portsea one summer. Glimpse the young boy who courted me walking along the beach, his smooth brown shoulders glowing in the sun. Recently, I saw an old home movie of ours. It brought you back to me. A boy, absorbed in adoration for his Triumph motorbike and later loving his E.H. Holden. The dreams seem more real than the flickering home movie. For a second, I refeel the long married years, then quickly disentangle myself from the pain and the choked dreams. People tend to define real writers by their audience. Um, a literary writer has a critical literary audience. A commercial writer has a wide commercial audience. But I think that there's another kind of writer who uh, is ignored, and that's the writer who has their own community of readers. And I also think that those readers, readers are in a lot of ways disregarded as not being real readers. The group I belong to, Western Women Writers, um, I've been a member of that group for five years, and I feel it's a very special group of women, um, not only just within the writing, but there's a very um, deep form of friendship that's there. Um, people aren't afraid in that group to give you constructive criticism. Um, I like to write um, comedy things if I can, humorous situations, um, just a whole lot of things and about when my daughters got married, about how the zip got stuck in the wedding dress, lots of things like that. I just sort of like to turn real life situations around to a story but you know I always sort of exaggerate a little bit and stretch the truth a bit. No one's sort of safe when they're around me because you don't know if they're going to end up in the story. The wedding. Maggie? Maggie? God Maggie where are you? What's the matter now Mum? The flowers. That's what's the matter. Take a look. Chris, Andy, come here. What's up, Mum? The flowers. These are orange. Yeah, so what? You were supposed to collect pink and cream flowers. Too late now, Mum. Shop's shut. What are we going to do? Maggie stood looking at the ugly flowers in their dainty lace holders. She tugged the offending flowers and they spewed out all over the carpet. 
Bob, quickly, get me those cream roses from the dining table. Gran, pass that vase over from the piano. Over and over, willing herself to remain calm, carefully twisting the wire and flowers, finally satisfied knowing she'd saved the day. Mum, Mum, what's up now? Maggie muttered. Her daughter's voice ended in a deep shuddering sigh as she looked into her mother's eyes. Sue's dress. Not the dress. Anything but the dress. Maggie's mouth twisted as she gently tugged the zip. It seemed like a nightmare. She stopped aware that her heart was racing. Just keep calm, girls. You'll see the funny side of this later. Hesitating, she gave a final tug and the zip closed perfectly. Grab those pins and cotton. Put them in my bag just in case. Hello, folks. Sorry I'm late. Been one of those days. The words slurred together. The boys laughed at their mother's disgusted voice. He's drunk. Maggie led the tipsy photographer to the kitchen and proceeded to pour black coffee into him. Susie appeared in the doorway. Her dress of white lace and her long flowing train made her a vision of loveliness. She was followed by her sister in pale pink. Horrified, the girls said together, Mommy's drunk. I guess writing would always free us in some way. Um, where, as Patricia's song says, we can climb mountains, we can fly the, over the water. I don't write uh, for exorcism, I write for pleasure. The most important thing for, in writing for me is writing, getting my message across in a way that people can understand. I, I like the beauty of the words and I like to put them down in a certain way, what we call a poetic way, but unless they can be understood, I feel I'm not doing what I want to do. I write about things that appear to me in a particular way, um, sometimes from an odd perspective. Often ideas will come from things that I've seen or heard. Um, I have particular themes I've discovered that keep recurring. For example, I've apparently been writing about escape for several years, sometimes without realising. And I've been told that that happens to lots of people and that you just work your way through it. The poem, Struck by an Urge to Live in Brighton, was written after I'd been to a poetry workshop in Hampton and I drove down North Road for the first time on my way home and ended up writing a poem. But when we went back to film the uh, visuals for the poem, it turned out that the house that I had imagined in the poem doesn't actually exist and Beach Road at the bottom of North Road is not on the beach. So I don't know where that came from. I think that's an example of how things get imagined or changed in our minds before we write. Struck by an urge to live in Brighton. North Road envelops me in a cloak of leaves. I slow and catch glimpses of noble houses. They draw me with their piece of age settled in quiet grandeur, intrinsic to the oaks and lush green lawns. I imagine polished boards, a ticking clock, sweeping stairs and hidden rooms. But then the street has passed and I am into a different dream. Late afternoon sun burnishes the waves a silver slate. The water bounds and falls across the sand alive with rough, relentless rhythm, indifferent to the coloured sails which skim and swoop. Houses here have acres of glass and lofty perches to spy on the sea. Up that high, there would be no beach road, just the moods of the ocean and my horizons. For me, a real writer, um, and everyone's got different ideas, um, has a, um, a lot, great, a huge perception of life, whereas a lot of people say oh, this, the world for them is this bigger writer. It's a lot, lot bigger. And I think when people are reading a book, 
it's a very um, personal experience. Um, you know, I think they go to it to read a book for something that they don't get in their own lives, or well, they go to a book um, to get different things out of, so than they would watching Neighbours. Yeah, I think Two Rider has has a role in the community, um, which is even harder to put a finger on. I think, um, and it's a similar role, and it's often giving a voice to to things that society's denying or avoiding or oppressing, or whatever. I find that writing can make me physically very tired and sometimes I don't know why I feel so tired and then I'll remember I've perhaps been writing um, for about eight hours straight but to me it seems such a pleasure to do it that I don't think of it as work until I feel this tiredness and um, I have heard people say that that uh, writing is a chore to them and I get very resentful inside when I hear people say that because um, um, as two American writers I, who were being interviewed said, they think that's a lot of shit, that writing is hard work. It was a joy to them also to write. A few times I've been to the Writers' Festival, I've been very disappointed with it and come home feeling like, oh, yeah, those wankers or <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of good writers, but I still often feel that, that um, you know, people, writers go to the Spilato Writers Festival more to, to meet each other and to rub each other's shoulders and to do anything about writing. And it just, to me, always seemed like it's a closed circle. And, um, and the writers have sort of slowly been sort of building themselves into a little corner and they're quite happy to sit there and talk to each other and not worry about the rest of the world. But I think... Um, and then sit around and complain that no one reads their writing. I sort of think the writers have got to dig themselves out of the corner and start, um, you know, writing for writing for the Australian public. You know, and that doesn't mean every writer should be a populist or whatever. But um, I think there's this attitudes developed in the writing circle that um, the fewer people who can understand your book, the better it is. And I sort of disagree with that. In my writing life. I would like to get some things published. Um, I would just like the opportunity to keep writing and feel that I'm getting somewhere in what I call is my field. If it didn't get any better than it is now, that would be great. I joined a writing group in 1982 and about six years ago I made a conscious decision to become a writer and that meant starting to take myself seriously, to send stuff out for publication, do readings. And it was a scary decision in a way because it changes your perspective of yourself. I think one of the processes of being a real writer is that you work through that self-doubt into something that pleases you, that you're happy with. Um, but then you find that it's not as good as you thought it could be, so you go back and you try harder. And I think that's always, that point of being satisfied with what you're writing is always just in front of you, so that you're always trying to do better. And uh, I think that's what real writers do, is they persevere. Just me. Out here in the bush, there is just me. He has no car, no house, no clothes. Bird is bird, tree is tree, and I am just me. When the lights get turned off in the bush, just me realises he can't turn them on again. He has dirt between toes, sweat under armpits, and messy hair. He feels the wind, the rain, the earth. So close, he's not sure if it's just him and the world, or just the world. Well, I suppose I'm looking at writing as a career, so, um, um, I suppose a bit of success would be very good and some money, it'd be great too. Um, well, I suppose I'm looking at it as a long-term thing, so I'm always trying to develop my writing and every time I start a new project to try and make myself do something new and, and better or bigger or whatever than I did before. Um, but I suppose the thing that keeps me going is, I guess, but it's good to have sort of things published and everything, but I suppose it's also about um, 
people relating to what you're doing. You know, I can remember a few times where people have come up to me, I think it's about two, <laughs> I can remember them very well, um, where people have come up after reading something. And, um, and there was one guy who I met and I'd played footy with and he looked like a pretty rough sort of guy, not the kind of guy to read poetry. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, oh, no, I read your poems. And I said, oh, great, yeah, <laughs> what, what, you know? Um, and then he said, yeah, I, I could really relate to them. So I suppose a few times that's people said that to me, I suppose I remember that. And that's probably the thing that I'll, I'll look back when I'm an old man and say <laughs> it was all worth the effort. Yeah.